six. And over a lot of time, scientists have identified different elements and different compositions that yield the optimal properties for these applications. Now, of course, uh, new technologies are always becoming available, and at uh, this time, at a faster rate than we can develop new materials. So really, the core challenge of materials design is how can we come up with materials for these new applications quickly? So of course, one route to doing so is to replace uh, expensive or otherwise time-consuming experiments with computational models. And provided the large breadth of lengths and time scales over which interesting materials behaviors occur, there's a correspondingly broad set of tools to enable them. And the course of to enable the design based on those processes. And of course, today I'm going to be talking about a relatively new field of computational material science, that being machine learning driven design. So a perfunctory machine learning slide. Specifically, when I'm discussing machine learning today, I'll be talking about supervised learning algorithms. Those classes of algorithms, which given many examples of the inputs and outputs to some complex function, can derive a uh, computationally efficient approximation. And there are a broad variety of approaches for managing this task, ranging from a linear regression all the way up to more complicated approaches like deep neural networks. And these offer many unique advantages to the design of materials. As I've already mentioned, they're computationally inexpensive. You can evaluate them at rates far exceeding most physics-based machine learning, or physics-based materials models. They're adaptable. Um, you can use machine learning without a complete understanding of the physics driving the problem. And additionally, they're self-correcting. Uh, simply by adding more data, in many cases, you can improve the accuracy of a data-driven model. And over the course of when I started out as a PhD student, there were a number of many interesting applications for applying machine learning to design and materials. And one question that's really been driving me since then is how can we take studies like these and turn them into everyday activities for material scientists? So this will be the main focus of my talk today. In particular, I'll be discussing general purpose methods for building machine learning models for materials properties. I'll give several examples for how we can use machine learning to develop new metallic glass alloys. And then conclude with a brief discussion of some of the software infrastructure my colleagues and I are developing to help enable the use of machine learning in more activities. So as I mentioned, I'll be starting out today with the development of general purpose approaches for machine learning. So often for machine learning problems, I'll break it down into four interrelated steps. Of course, there's uh, acquiring a large uh, repository of the raw data that will service uh, training data. From that raw data, identifying what are the useful inputs and outputs to a machine learning model. Translating that data into a form compatible with machine learning, and then finally building a machine learning. Now, if we want to build a problem-independent technique, these first two steps are where we'll focus our efforts. Additionally, there are a broad variety of machine learning approaches, and as of yet, no real strong justification that material science requires new ones. So really, the question of how do we develop uh, general purpose approaches for building machine learning models boils down to this third step of how can I develop problem-independent representations for materials. So diving into representations in a little more detail, a representation is a set of quantitative attributes that describe a material, and functionally this is what serves as inputs into a machine learning model. The materials community has studied this area quite extensively and agreed these representations need to fulfill many different properties, such as completeness. A representation needs to accurately differentiate materials that are indeed different. They need to be efficient to compute and capture important effects about what drives materials properties. Now to explain this point in a little more detail, I will consider an example where I want to build a machine learning model that identifies which three of these compounds are ionic materials. Of course, I can order them by their sodium fractions, which is complete and efficient to compute, but it doesn't line up with my intuition about what's actually driving this problem. Whereas if I had ordered the materials based on their electronegativity, this matches up with a physical intuition about uh, what explains ionic materials, and leads to a simpler and probably more accurate machine learning model. And it's these kind of informative descriptors that we need to develop for a large class of problems. Now, material science uh, really complicates this problem with what can serve as a tool for differentiating materials. 
If I'm, for example, modeling the effect of different elements on the dilute mixing enthalpies in zirconia, my uh, uh, descriptor could be as simple as a single element. If it's modeling the effect of microstructure on yield strength, I need to know the identity of phases and how they're related to each other in space. So considering this broad range of problems for machine learning and material science, uh, we're going to focus on these two, composition and crystal structure, for the purposes of my talk today. So I'll start first with composition. So to develop a problem-independent representation for a composition of a material, uh, we started out by looking at many examples of these kinds of models in the literature. And this table is showing five of them. Uh, we first uh, looked at a study by Kong and others in 2012, which used attributes like the number of valence electrons, differences in electronegativities, to predict which crystal structure is likely to form that composition. Uh, this, a similar uh, research group used a different set of attributes to predict band gap energy. And a little further down the table, there are a variety of different attributes that have been successfully used to model a variety of materials properties. But all of them are similar in the fact that they're based on statistics of the properties of the elements. So when coming up with a uh, general representation that could cover all of these types of machine learning problems, uh, we follow a similar strategy. Specifically, we came up with a set of 145 attributes that are primarily based on elemental property statistics. Specifically, we consider uh, six different statistics of 22 different elemental properties. And also use a variety of different other categories of attributes, like stoichiometric attributes, which depend on the fractions of elements, but not necessarily what those elements are. And these include things like the number of components in an alloy. And we've been able to use this uh, general set of attributes to model many different problems. And I'll start off with a simple one. In this task, uh, we provide the machine learning algorithm with 3,000 examples of, given the composition, whether this material has a, band, a positive band gap or not. Now, training a simple decision tree model, we end up with uh, this simple approach. If the alloy contains an element with a Mendeleev number of greater than 86, these are elements along the right side of the periodic table, and it is charge balanced, the model gets non-metal of positive band gap with 68% likelihood. Now, if I evaluate this on the rest of the OQMD, it yields an accuracy of about 84%, which this is better than random guessing. It's worse than perfect. But to put in additional context, we developed a game where we tasked humans with the same problem. And over the course of 10,000 iterations of this game, which is available on a server at Northwestern in case you're interested, uh, we found our uh, human users averaged about 77 or, uh, percent on these, across these 10,000 iterations. I've taken this a few hundred times, and I'm about statistically average at this task. But our machine learning model achieves an accuracy of about 87 percent. So this is showing, even for this simple problem, building a very simple machine learning model, uh, we can develop reasonably accurate models with this uh, approach. And of course, we can use it for more complex tasks. Uh, this chart is showing the results of a tenfold cross-validation test, where we trained a machine learning model on three distinct properties from the OQMD, the formation enthalpy, band gap energy, and density, and found that in all cases, we achieved a reasonably accurate machine learning model, a correlation coefficient of above 0.9 using the same set of 145 attributes. And in this case, we use the same machine learning algorithm random for us for this task. So this shows us how we can build a machine learning model relatively quickly if we can standardize the inputs that we're giving it. Now to show something completely different where we don't use data, DFT data about crystalline structures, I'll talk a little bit about metallic glasses. I'll be diving into more detail about metallic glasses later in the talk. But one of their key challenges is it's difficult to identify which alloys can form a metallic glass. Now, provided uh, 7,000 experimental measurements taken from a landau bornstein handbook, we built a model that predicts a simple property. Given this composition, can we form a metallic glass or not? And this random forest model yields an accuracy of about 90%. Again, this is better than random. But to really put this in context, we designed a test that would emulate how we would use this model in practice. Now, our intended application is to be able to take this model and use it to identify, given a new set of elements, oh, is it possible to form a metallic glass in this system? And if so, what are the most likely compositions? So to emulate this test, we extracted a 
of one of the ternary systems from our training set. And we chose the aluminum, nickel, zirconium system because one has been very extensively evaluated. And two, it has an interesting feature. There are two regions of positive glass forming ability. And without seeing any of this data in the training set, our machine learning model gets the fact that it has uh, two regions of uh, likely glass formation. In this chart, darker predictions are a higher probability of forming metallic glasses. And the model gets their relative sizes and positions rel uh, relatively correct. And to emphasize, this is using the same set of inputs that we use for the machine learning on density functional theory data. So here we're feeling that uh, this representation will allow us to build new machine learning models without having to reinvent the wheel of how to train it on materials data. Uh, the other task we focused on was how to build a machine learning model given the crystal structure of a material. And here we developed an approach based on the Voronoi tessellation of the crystal structure. So Voronoi tessellation partitions space into regions closest to single points. And given this data, we can describe a lot of information about an atom's local environment. These include information such as, well, what is the identity of the element in the center of the, the tessellation? What is its coordination number or bond lengths? Differences between property of itself and its neighbors. And we can use this information to acquire a set of around 270 attributes. Now, to test out this approach, the first task we explored was uh, cross-validation uh, test similar to a paper by Popper and others from 2015. Here we uh, assembled a data set of 32,000 DFT calculations from the OQMD and trained a machine learning model with uh, progressively larger amounts of the remaining data. Uh, this chart here is showing the, the accuracy of predicting formation enthalpy as a function of training set size. And what we found was for all data set sizes larger than about three entries, we achieve an error of about a factor of two better than the existing approaches at the time. Now, of course, this is uh, interesting. It's showing that our machine learning model is, in fact, working, but it doesn't necessarily model how we would use it in practice. So to do so, we uh, studied the application of this model to a prototype search. So this is a commonly uh, used approach in high-throughput computational material science, where one takes a uh, particular crystal structure prototype decorates it with many different compositions, and then uses DFT to identify which are most likely to be stable. So given that only a small fraction of the materials evaluated are actually stable, uh, there's a large over, uh, potential opportunity to accelerate this with machine learning. So to emulate this kind of test, uh, we designed a test where we trained the machine learning model on the same 32,000 entries I used for the cross-validation test, and then tasked it with sorting uh, materials based on three different prototype structures from most to least stable. This result is showing how many of the entries in the top 100 uh, that were predicted to be most stable were actually known to be the most stable within DFT. And here we're showing that for each of the three prototype test cases, we again exceed uh, the existing approaches. And you may be wondering, uh, what's the difference between the um, unshaded bars and the darker ones? So to model this approach, we first started with giving the machine learning model an initial guess for the crystal structure, that is, before we use DFT to determine the equilibrium positions. The uh, unshaded bars are showing what is the accuracy when we actually give the machine learning model the relaxed structure. So this is the best possible guess for what the structure of the material is. Even if we give the best possible guess for the structure, our machine learning model's accuracy only improves slightly and it still remains the uh, most accurate out of the three methods we tested. What this is showing us is that our machine learning model would be an excellent choice for accelerating high throughput combinatorial searches. So this wraps up my discussion of representations. And just to uh, summarize, I've discussed an approach for building models based on the composition of the material that can be used for problems as widely ranging as predicting the glass ability of metallic alloys and the stability of crystalline compounds provided DFT data. And I've talked about an approach for building models based on the crystal structure. What I've uh, really delved into is an example of how to explore, how to actually use these in practice. That'll be the focus of the next part of my talk.
So all three examples in this section are going to use, describe metallic glasses. So I'll start off by explaining a little bit more about why they're interesting. So these materials are unique. They're metals that form in amorphous structures, which endows them with a number of unique properties. Uh, because they're amorphous, the typical deformation me me mechanism of dislocation glide is not accessible. So these materials have a very high yield strength compared to conventional metals. The fact that they don't crystallize during cooling means that you can form high precision casting uh, with net shaped casting techniques. And because there are no grain boundaries, these materials have low magnetic hysteresis, which makes them materials that are commonly used in high efficiency electrical transformers. Now, of course, the amorphous structure of these materials also prevent, causes some negative effects. Uh, the first of which is that very few systems are known to form metallic glasses. Of all possible ternaries of metallic, of metallic elements, only 2% are known to form metallic glasses. Additionally, the term bulk is somewhat of a misnomer. A bulk casting for an amorphous metal is typically only a millimeter thick. So you can only achieve very thin walled parts with metallic glasses and maintain their amorphous properties. Additionally, processing these materials can be difficult. If you heat them up, they may revert to their equilibrium crystal structures, again, destroying their useful properties. And while these are all uh, challenges that can be avoided with careful engineering, the process of designing new metallic glasses is limited by the fact that there aren't many theories for describing how a composition of an alloy uh, relates to any of these three properties. And of course, uh, we're going to explore uh, optimizing these three properties. Uh, glass ability, the critical casting thickness as described by the maximum casting diameter, and process ability using the supercooled liquid range which describes the difference between the crystallization temperature and the glass transition temperature of the alloy. So going back to this uh, four-step workflow for building a machine learning model, uh, the first thing we did was assemble a data set from the literature. This is from the landau Bornstein handbook and around 40 different technical papers, uh, which has a few thousand entries for each of these properties we're interested in. Uh, we then built a machine learning model using this general purpose approach as well as incorporating different theories for how glasses form, uh, taken from the metallic glass community's literature. And then we built a machine learning model using conventional random forest-based machine learning algorithms. Uh, the first test we explored for using these was to optimize existing commercial alloys. Specifically, uh, we took two different alloys that are commercialized by liquid metal and attempted to optimize their pro uh, properties for the two different uh, processing parameters we're able to predict with machine learning. Uh, this chart here shows the result of two million different machine learning predictions that are slight perturbations of these original alloys. And to identify which ones to test experimentally, we performed Pareto analysis, which, with which we identified two materials that are likely to outperform the base material in both properties. We did this both for the LM601 alloy and the LM105, which has titanium, which I believe is included for corrosion resistance. Our experimental collaborators then tested these alloys using their conventional commercial processing methods and found that uh, three of our six predictions did indeed exceed the base alloys. Uh, this chart shows the experimentally measured casting thickness. Here we measured it using the strength limiting casting thickness method and the, the super cool liquid range. The base materials are shown in the unshaded uh, blocks, and our predicted machine learning alloys are in the colored ones. <coughs> what we found is that three of our alloys did indeed exceed the base materials in at least one of the properties, and two of which had a larger supercool liquid range, that is, better processability, without a significant decrease in the casting thickness. What, demonstrate, what this demonstrates is the ability of machine learning to identify potential alloys that could be better suited for different applications. For example, if there's a need for an alloy that requires better processability, but not necessarily a better casting thickness, machine learning could hopefully identify it. Uh, the other test we tried was a bit more ambitious. We first enumerated uh, 26 million ternary alloys by combining 53 different elements from which, in about two days of computing time, identified 38,000 that were likely to form metallic glasses with excellent processability and casting thicknesses. 
Uh, we then identified three that contained, or two systems that contained alloys that were easy to process and were non-poisonous. And here we didn't have as much success. Our copper hafnium titanium system crystallized during uh, casting, and that's visible in the speckled pattern on this micrograph, as well as the crack. And our copper hafnium magnesium alloys ignited during processing. And of course, uh, that's not really desirable in commercial alloys, and we didn't explore testing them further. And while we weren't successful here, we actually learned a lot from this experience. Uh, the first of which, uh, we later found in the literature that one of the two copper hafnium titanium alloys we tested is actually known to form metallic glasses, but with a different processing technique than what we use. So what this really tells us is when building machine learning models, it's very important to consider what are the processing methods going into these materials and incorporating that into the predictions. Additionally, uh, some discretion is warranted in identifying uh, which alloys to test. In retrospect, uh, hafnium melts 1,000 degrees above where magnesium boils. So this would have been a very difficult technique to process using arc melting. So in the future, we uh, strongly recommend trimming down the search space based on some knowledge about the processing conditions. So the third test we explored was how to find new metallic glasses based on a sputtering technique. So sputtering is uh, used to create wear coatings for materials based on metallic glasses. And to try to find new alloys, uh, we explored a ternary space of around 2.4 million alloys. And these are combinations of 24 different elements that are easy to use in deposition equipment. So even with automated high throughput computational or experimental techniques, it would take about six years to evaluate all of these alloys, if you could do so 365 days a year. So certainly this warrants uh, machine learning for identifying where are the most likely experiments that would yield the most uh, useful materials the most quickly. So here we started by uh, tuning our machine learning model for processing conditions. To do so, we started by taking the machine learning model based on melt spinning data, which I described earlier in the talk, and then use this machine learning model as an input into a model based on sputtering data. This stacking approach allows us to identify in which alloys a melt spinning technique would actually yield similar results to sputtering. And we found, and this is the results from a cross-validation test, that by incorporating the melt spinning data in our machine learning model this way, we could achieve better accuracy than we could by modeling these two techniques uh, separately. Uh, this chart here is showing the results for one particular system, the copper vanadium uh, zirconium. And we find that actually accounting for sputtering can have a, a very marked change on the predictions from the machine learning model. The darker regions in these two plots indicates where our model predicts of the largest chance of glass formability. And you'll note that we predict glass formation with a larger uh, vanadium content than we would have otherwise, and with a smaller zirconium content. And that will be important later. The next thing we did was incorporate more theories from the metallic glass community into these models. Specifically, we chose a uh, theory based on atomic size mismatches and uh, mixing thermochemistry uh, from Yang and Zong in 2012, and a, uh, a uh, atomic packing model from one of our collaborators at the University of New South Wales. And these two theories um, have a bit of a disagreement. The thermochemistry-based model predicts glass formation in the high zirconium and low zirconium region whereas the cluster packing model only predicts it in the central region. So this is particularly interesting to us because it actually showcases another advantage of machine learning. By incorporating these models as inputs into our machine learning uh, representation, well, we can effectively identify when, which are the alloys for which each of these theories are more predictive. We found that this actually has a small benefit to our model for this particular system because our machine learning model was already predicting metallic glasses in the same region. So given this model that now incorporates theories and processing conditions as an input, uh, we, our collaborators at SLAC, the University of South Carolina, and NIST uh, went out and performed high throughput combinatorial synthesis and actually found that our machine learning model agreed decently uh, with what we can actually find with sputtering. Uh, you'll note here, we both predict of glasses forming at a high vanadium content, which is different than what we'd expect based on melt spinning data. But our machine learning model predicts 
uh, these compositions with much smaller zirconium contents than what we find experimentally. Now, one of the interesting parts about this to me is, given this new high-throughput data, we can incorporate it into our machine learning model, and now, of course, we predict this copper vanadium zirconium system with high accuracy. Now, using this improved model, we actually find that it agrees with experimental data from other systems better. Uh, the charts on the left here are showing the machine learning model's predictions before we added copper vanadium zirconium, and then afterwards. And I'll note that for the copper iron zirconium system, we predict glass forming in the central band, uh, which is different than what we were predicting before. And our likelihood of predicting glasses is reduced significantly in the niobium <coughs> iron titanium system, which is actually in agreement with experimental measurements much better. And we found that this improvement in accuracy is not just better for these two hand-selected systems, but across the entire training set. Now, this chart here is showing the receiver operating characteristic curve uh, produced by the sleeve ternary out test, where we iter iteratively removed uh, one of the 35 ternary diagrams as a test set for our machine learning model, trained on the remaining data, and iterated through all diagrams. And you'll note that our original model, which only used melt spinning data, had a much smaller area under the curve, and therefore worse classification scores, than our final model based on the entire data set, the uh, sputtering data plus all of the data produced with our high throughput experimentation. And what this really motivates to us is an iterative design strategy where we can employ machine learning to identify which experiments are the most likely uh, to produce good materials. That data will become immediately useful in uh, improving the accuracy of the model uh, to generate new and better predictions. But another thing we found in the course of the study is this high throughput experiment data is also useful in developing new theories. Our collaborator, Kevin, who I mentioned earlier, noted that s systems with very similar atomic sizes actually have a marked change in glass permeability. And this can serve as useful data for him for refining his uh, cluster packing model, which will feed back into our machine learning model and hopefully improve the accuracy of the even further. So in general, this is kind of iterative approach is what I think could be a, a very important method in the future for materials design. And really one thing that I've identified over the course of these studies is one of the factors limiting machine learning from being uh, used more prevalently is a disconnect between the folks developing machine learning models and those who would actually use them in practice. And really there are three major areas where the lack of the ability to share information is inhibiting these kind of studies. The first of which is being able to share the data that serves as a raw input to the machine learning models. There's, of course, the techniques themselves and the actual models produced. And over the last uh, couple minutes of this talk, I'll discuss an effort my colleagues and I are doing at the University of Chicago to help limit these issues. Uh, the first of which is a project called Materials Data Facilities. We're building data infrastructure to help ease the process of sharing materials data. NDF, which is a tool built on the Globus Toolkit, uh, has two distinct um, entities worth noting. Uh, the first of which is a data publication tool, which allows us to publish data that we don't actually own the computing systems for. Uh, we can assign a, a citable DOI, so these will appear in Google Scholar just alongside any other publications. And we can use it to uh, share it even if it's uh, held on your institution's computing systems. More recently, we've been building a data discovery system where we go through this data that we've published and scrape out the materials-related information from each file to make it easier to identify what is actually contained within each of these data sets. Uh, furthermore, we've been going out to the materials community and harvesting other databases and publishing their information as well, and then sharing it out with other entities. For example, we look for the kind of data that Citrine Informatics, a startup out of the San Francisco area, can incorporate into their materials database, and we'll send that information to, themselves, to them. Additionally, we're going to be building in the next few months the capability of sending any DFT data we find in these publications along to Nomad, so that people can find the data using the tools they're most familiar with, even if that isn't the materials data facility. Uh, the next area I've been working is to build open source software to allow others to perform machine learning. And these take the form of two different libraries. The first of which, Magpie, which is a Java library I built as a PhD student. 
uh, contains all of the representation methods I discussed earlier, as well as linkages to machine learning libraries and a REST API for building websites on top of these models to really help make it easier for other people to build. More recently, I've been working with uh, groups that, uh, to train in Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to construct a Python library called MapMiner that possesses a lot of these same functionalities, but is closely integrated with the SciPy tools and many of the other machine learning uh, libraries that have become popular in the community. And really, the bottom line for you today is that any of the work that I talked about in the past uh, couple slides, you can do with Magpie. I published the data, the scripts, and the software necessary to recreate them. And soon you'll be able to do that with MapMiner as well. Uh, the third area is a little more aspirational, as this is a relatively new project. Uh, DL Hub is a project out of Argonne National Lab. We're seeking to build the infrastructure that will allow people to share their machine learning models. An example of a, a use for this in materials is, let's say I've used MapMiner to build a model that predicts the stability of materials using data from the OQMD. I can publish this to DL Hub, receive a citable digital object identifier, which would allow somebody else to come along, find this model, use it on a new data set to predict the stability of different crystals, and hopefully use that to engage new science, and because this has been published in a citable way, reference back to the original authors in a way that ensures everyone's contributions are recognized. And this is something we're going to be building extensively this summer and populating with many libraries, or many uh, models from the, machine, the materials community. So this wraps up my talk for today. Uh, in conclusion, I've talked about a few different approaches for building general purpose representations and materials. Given two examples of how we can use machine learning to design new metallic glass alloys and discuss some of the open infrastructure for accelerating the use of machine learning in materials science. At this point, I'd like to thank my sponsors and would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you. Start. You gave the you had this nice idea of predictions, but did the experimentalists have to cover your entire configuration space when they did the measurements? So for the uh, yeah the top classes? Yeah. Uh, no, we uh, tried only maybe three. Well, we're up to six different systems. We go through and identify which are most e easy for them to work with given their systems, and couple that with which are the most likely to be useful based on their machine learning predictions, and it's actually a relatively small number. And when you get that feedback from them, is there any way for you to understand what's missing from your model? That's an excellent question. It's not one we've explored very much. Yep. But what I would really be interested in is to see how are the important variables changing over time. Are we finding that, indeed, the, the inputs related to a certain theory are more important than another one? And is there anything changing about the science as we add more data? That would be one thing that we could do, but I uh, haven't looked into it yet. Yeah, you would have a lot of to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be missing. Anything else? So then in the, the model that you trained in this example, how did you incorporate the information that you had these two different data sets that came from the two different casting methods? <coughs> uh, the uh, first approach we used was to add a variable uh, that would describe <clears throat> which data this came from, one if sputtering, zero if um, melt spinning. We ended up finding that it would be better to, rather than include that single variable, which in the 140 other variables in the model doesn't come through as very important, uh, we can actually have better success by using the output of one model trained on one type of data as input into another one. Because it turns out actually that if we just use that single discrete variable, that model is wor uh, worse than if we train the two machine learning models completely separately. It just has very little effect. Okay, anything else? Well, maybe I missed it, but uh, how do you find the attributes for a given property? Pardon? How, how do you find the attributes for a given property? Oh, we um, take the, uh, in our case, the composition of the material, and then we evaluate many different statistics, just looking up the atomic numbers and radii and compute different statistics about them, say the mean melting temperature of the elements or the standard deviation and the uh, atomic radius. 
Is that your point? Yes. So that yeah. is uh, uh, the big thing uh, among the populace for any person. Exactly. But we found later that we can even improve the model further uh, if we understand more about uh, the problem. For example, in the metallic glass study, we took theories from the literature about uh, what explains whether a material will be amorphous or not. I found that those can have an impact on the model. Not often large, but it's still a viable route for further improving a machine learning model. So I uh, use random, the random forest algorithm. So my, my question is, what happens if you give features that are not, you know they're not relevant for the problem? But uh, and then do the algorithm get confused? It needs more data? Because usually if you are looking for something, you don't know what you need to put in. I mean, you can have an idea, but so I was wondering how is how stable is that if I put 2,000 features, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we find that uh, for very large data sets, um, using any approach to reduce the dimensionality, to cut down the number of attributes in the model, doesn't have a market effect. Now, I started with saying uh, for large data sets, because actually once we find that we have smaller than a few hundred or maybe even a few thousand entries, employing some kind of feature selection technique can significantly improve the accuracy of the model. Here, we actually use functionality from Random Forest to do that. Uh, we use its descriptions of what are the most accurate variables and use that to gradually refine the space. I may ask another question. So at the, the very beginning, when you introduced your, your descriptors, you had uh, three applications, one of which was the band cap. Yeah. You showed the, the prediction plots, right? The best prediction would be on the diagonal. And the band cap came out to be the worst. So the, yeah. I mean, there was the largest scatter and the largest uncertainty in the predictions. Um, do you know why? And do you have a feeling for why and, and how it could be improved? That's an excellent like, question. So one of the reasons why I suspect is that my training set contained a lot of metallic materials, um, many of which are from searches for intermetallics for strengthening systems. So a large 70% of our data set really didn't have much useful information in the machine learning model. So there was, given the other two comparisons, it likely had the smallest amount of useful data uh, for making predictions. So if you took out all the methods that you knew and only trained it on systems that really had a band cap. I mean, have you tried? Does it improve? Yeah, effectively, we've tried something similar. Uh, rather than directly training on band gap, uh, we'll first train a model that, given composition, will identify whether it's likely to be a metal or not, uh, which we can achieve pretty strong accuracies uh, for. And then, given those two subsets, train a machine learning model. And now we can find it's been a while since I ran that exact test, but it was a significant improvement on the model's accuracy. So it's doing effectively that kind of approach with a data-driven method. OK. That's Just a very last question. Just how good are the experts at predicting what is metal? So um, compared to the I allow most people to take this test anonymously, and a large fraction of people who go to the web page don't enter a username that allows me to trace back to them. The best user that I found when this was being tried out in my research group was one of the other PhD students, and he achieved an accuracy of a low 80%. I also had a, a friend who was a medical student, who actually I think was the highest overall. During lectures, he played this game, I think, 1,500 times. <laughs> and by, I designed it there. Yes and no are directly next to each other on the keyboard, so you don't really have to exert much physical effort to play it. And hopefully that's a good advertisement for getting more data for it. But I think his uh, eventual score was also in the low 80s. I also designed the test to have an accuracy of the model that's close enough to humans to keep it interesting. If rather than 3,000 data points, we gave it 250,000, it's well out of the bound of any, uh, any of the users that I've seen. Yeah, thanks for your question. OK, let's thank the speaker.